So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. This is our first session for the Local Food, local food Summit. Food summit. Uh, Midwest Permaculture has uh, six sessions that we're doing with uh, various friends and speakers. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking forward to sharing those with you. Yeah, this first session, um, what we want to do is introduce you to us, Bill and Becky Wilson, and the work that we've done with Midwest Permaculture over the last 11 years. And a key person in helping us do what we've been able to do for the last 10 years has been Milton Dixon. So um, I asked Milton if he'd be willing to join us on this first session because we're going to show pictures of our uh, yard and, and actually talk a little bit about why we're interested in permaculture. He's one of our teachers. He's one of our designers. He's our main IT person. He's been really instrumental in helping Midwest permaculture uh, stay grounded in the world. So we asked him to join us for this session. So Milton, thank you very much for that. You're very welcome. It's fun to cause trouble for you. You do a good job of that. <laughs> well, we pulled together some slides of our house. And um, in particular, because we've been working on it for about 10 years now, it's nice to see before and after shots. And so we thought it would be nice to share a lot of those uh, with you, as well as the overall design uh, for our property. Just to kick things off here, here's a, a picture of our house when I first moved into it. This is even before Becky and I were together. So this has been 37 years as when I moved into the houses. And there's a little small tree in the front of the house. That thing's a monster now. Uh, here's what the house looked like about 10 years later. And then the next slide shows where, how it looks today. It's kind of hard to see the house from the street because we have quite a bit of vegetation on there. So, um, and then I slide around here just so you can see our house uh, from the sidewalk going up and there's uh, echinacea and a variety of uh, some flocks and different flowers. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the uh, plants that we have in our yard. But um, I think the first thing I wanted to do was talk a little bit about why you and I are even interested in permaculture. I mean, what is it that uh, uh, encouraged us to launch Midwest Permaculture at the beginning of 2007? And um, I'll tell you, for, for me, this particular picture here uh, really hit home. I remember listening to a speaker about 15 years ago talking about some of the challenges that we reach, that we have in this country. And one of the things he talked about was the number one um, export that we have in the United States. And I'm thinking it had to be corn or soybean. Here's a picture of a barge moving corn and soybean down the Mississippi River. But this particular speaker said it's not the corn or the soybeans. It's actually the topsoil in the water we're actually moving more topsoil out of our country than we are corn and soybean. Um, they say that uh, we export approximately um, almost 2 billion tons of topsoil a year. Here's a picture of a farm not too far from us. And in the spring when it rains, when it rains hard, it's, this is common to see washouts uh, in a lot of the fields around here. So um, that was a concern and that really woke me up. I said, well, wow, if we're losing that amount of soil every year, uh, from farming, particularly, it, that's uh, the number one reason for uh, loss of soil is the way we farm. Um, isn't there a way to farm where we don't uh, lose our soil? There's another uh, bit of information we came across which has to do with the hydrological cycles. Uh, in particular, uh, in a natural environment, uh, you'll have, um, you know, whether it be forest or prairie, you'll have about 40% evaporation and 10% runoff uh, that's the water that stays on the surface. And then the ground water that goes uh, down below the surface is your shallow infiltration and your deep infiltration. Shallow infiltration are the creeks and the rivers, and the deep infiltration is uh, the aquifers. And so uh, you have about a 50% of the water stays above ground through evaporation or runoff, and 50% goes down into the ground. But what happens when we put an urban environment on top of the ground is these numbers change wildly because water can no longer soak into the ground. And so um, just from runoff and evaporation, we'll have more like 85% uh, loss that way. And only 15% is infiltrated now into the ground. So that went from 50% to 15%. Well, why is that such a big deal? Well, you do this around the entire country and we're changing the hydrological cycles. We're basically drying out our country. Uh, the uh, water, uh, the uh, creeks and rivers are dropping, the aquifers are dropping. Uh, we're just losing more and more water and slowly turning the North American continent into a, a desert, quite literally. You have to remember that the, in the uh, Middle East, even North Africa, those were very fertile areas at one point. 
but annual agriculture, when we till the soil, we disrupt the uh, hydrological cycles and will turn almost any environment into a desert after uh, tilling it. So those are big concerns. The solutions are relatively simple. Even in an urban environment, we can put in rain gardens. Like Kansas City had a, a project to put 10,000 rain gardens in. So just doing that itself, you're giving a place for wet water to rest and soak in. The solution is very simple. And so this is where this, our interest in permaculture came in is we have big problems, but wouldn't it be nice if there were simple solutions? And it turns out that there really are. There's one other situation with hydrological cycles and it has to do with farm country. And that is once we start doing annual agriculture, the amount of organic matter drops. And so when it rains, the water can't soak in. And the water that does soak in oftentimes will put drain tile in to pull that water off the land uh, so that farmers can get in with their tractors and their equipment more quickly. And, uh, and so uh, even in our farm country, which could be the place where we absorb water, we don't, that runs off as well. And if it doesn't run off the surface because it can't soak in, it runs off because we put drain tile in the ground and whip, whisk it away as soon as it gets down three or four feet below the surface. So these are some pretty big challenges, uh, even in farm country, 85, 15% uh, deep infiltration. And then the other thing that we came across was this, the amount of energy, this was new to me, the amount of actual oil we use or energy we use to actually make our industrial food system today. Here's a picture of an egg and all the different processes that go in to the production of that egg. Everything from the bottom left-hand corner, the, um, the growing of the grain, that takes about three calories for every calorie of grain that we raise. And then all of the chemicals we need for herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, and everything gets trucked. And then we take the grain to the livestock it says nothing about the humaneness of how we might be treating that livestock. And then when we do get the, uh, whether it's meat or eggs, in this case, the eggs, it has to be trucked, it has to be packaged, it has to be cooled. If we're lucky, the waste product from the egg production facility will end up on the land. But when all is said and done, that little egg that we buy in the store, for every calorie there is in the egg, it took 7.3 calories of oil to get that egg to us. Now this equation, I mean, if we had un unlended amount of oil and it would last forever, that would be one thing, but there is a finite amount of oil uh, in the world. So um, how do we get eggs to us? And so we were introduced to permaculture and this little sketch of a, um, here's a way to get an egg in a, in a neighborhood. One person could have a nice little greenhouse with several dozen chickens. And with this little, I'll let you, uh, you know, study this, uh, this little illustration yourself. It comes out of Bill Mollison's book, Introduction to Permaculture. It's a way to incorporate your raising of chickens with a greenhouse, harvesting water, uh, not only getting the eggs, but you get the litter from the, from the uh, chickens and, um, and you can grow food. So um, this is a nice, simple solution and um, it doesn't take any oil pretty much to, to raise chickens this way. So this was the kind of thing that woke us up. Uh, we also learned that it's possible when you really do intensive gardening, through biodynamics, uh, biointensive, uh, it's possible to grow up to 10 times the volume of food per acre than through industrial agriculture. Now that takes a lot more concentration, a lot more design, and even more human labor. But the point is it's possible to grow a lot more food. So uh, what was it, 2004 is when um, we actually hosted a course here in Stell, and uh, we took that course and it pretty much blew my mind. And I remember coming home and you and I talking and I just saying, Becky, this is, this is the stuff that uh, we want to be doing and this is the stuff that we want to be teaching. So we, we sponsored our first uh, course, Becky and I, uh, in the fall of 2006. I guess that would be our second course, but it was our first course as Bill and Becky in Midwest Permaculture. We did that here in Stell. And um, that was the beginning of uh, Midwest Permaculture for us. In the intervening years, so it's been about 10 years since that. A year later, we met Milton, and uh, he brought us into the technology world. Becky was already Thank pretty. Thank you, Milton. Yeah, <laughs> Becky was already pretty savvy, but uh, Milton uh, gave us an edge that we just didn't have. Um, and uh, here we are, 10 or 11 years later. Um, we uh, we offer these 72-hour permaculture design certificate courses. Do you want to just mention briefly what's contained in the course and what they consist of? Well, there's, um, it, it's based on Bill Mollison's designer's manual, uh, which he, he kind of, he wrote it 
that it would be a 72 hour curriculum that you could put into a college um, level kind of course. Uh, but it covers the subject matter, it covers everything from uh, looking at how you can assess the land, uh, assess the climate in any given place that you are on the planet, uh, the landforms, uh, the soil, and it, uh, it takes you through an entire um, assessment process and then you go into design strategies and then you go into um, techniques and solutions that you can use. But it's all based on ethics and principles too. So the ethics and principles are woven throughout the entire curriculum and you're always looking at and evaluating or assessing how that you can use those throughout any kind of um, technique that you might want to use. Uh, but it starts with big with, with uh, assessment and strategies and then ends up to fine tuning with, um, with specific techniques. But we will be able to see some demonstrations of these as we go through. Yeah. Well, permaculture is, it's really a design science. It's, it's not, um, you know, I, I don't know what, it's not a, uh, just a feel good kind of a thing. It's really a science on how do we as humans um, take responsibility for how we live on the planet. And uh, the big thing that I really loved about permaculture is Bill Mollison and David Holmgren uh, laid in three key permaculture um, ethics. And they are um, care for people, care for the planet, and um, sharing the surplus or caring for the future. So right off the bat, you've got an ethic that goes underneath the design principles. And if you're not caring for the land, you're not caring for others, you're not taking care of the future, we're not doing permaculture. So to create a more permanent culture, we have to pay attention to those three key areas. So that's the work. And so we've been doing this for almost 11 years now. And we've hosted um, over 70 uh, permaculture design certificate courses. So that's our main body of work and we've been doing more design work. And then in the process, we've been putzing in our own yard, came up with yeah. a bit of a design and <laughs> it just goes on and on. That's one I way to put it. Because it's part of the process is, is you design something, but then as you implement it, you start observing it and you say, wow, why don't we try this? And why don't we try that? So from the beginning, you know, you lay out something that you think will work fine, and it would work fine, and it did work fine. The basics did, and we'll show you some of that. But um, what has been really fun is to watch how it's evolved over the years. I mean, we look at it now, we've been here 10 years, and we're thinking, my gosh, there's so much so much more we can do. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. will say our yard is a whole lot more interesting than it was when it was just tree, grass, and bushes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was that was great for when our children were younger and we needed just lots of space in the yard for them to play. Uh, but now, actually, we have grandkids and they love running around on all these little paths that weave throughout our yard. Mm -hmm. And there's lots more places to hide and, you know, make little homes and things like that. So it's, um, you know, it's evolving as our life is evolving, too. But we sure enjoy it a lot more. We're in relationship with it a lot more than we were in the past. Yeah, we actually spend time in our yard. It's actually an extension of our house now, rather than just being something we mow. It's an extension of our of our life, of our house and of our life. Yeah. Well, let's start by just sharing a little bit about the basic design, um, a little bit about the water. So obviously water hits hits the roof of our home and these little arrows are showing, um, you know, where it comes off the roof. So if you see towards the right side of the picture, we've directed it all down to one um, downspout uh, near the net where it says number one there. And so all of the arrows of the, the rainwater coming off the roof goes down into that. And we call the first one rain garden number one. And then it flows into rain garden two. And then it flows into rain garden three. So this is the front half of our house. And this is how we capture water there. So there's three different beds. Um, they all have different functions. And um, What's nice too, and after rain garden number three, uh, you, when, when it's raining, it's pretty exciting. You can go outside and watch the water fill up, go into rain garden. It's, it's harder to see now than it was in the early days because there were, there's so many plants in there. But it'll go to rain garden one, we get about an inch, and then to rain garden two, about an inch, and rain garden number three, about an inch. And after they all have an inch of rain or, in them or so, you don't see water moving anymore. At that point, all three of them, the water in all three rises at the same rate. But at some point, the lowest point in that system is the end of rain garden number three. It spills over, as you can see in the illustration, there's a little dotted line that goes to the blue bar along our property line. The water backs up on that berm. That's a berm where we took all the, all the soil 
from those three rain gardens, we put it along the property line, creating a berm, and then we planted gooseberries and currants on that. And so now even that berm soaks up a tremendous amount of water until finally it bleeds over the, the very end and then it goes off our property. Now, instead of the water running right off our property, that will hold, the water takes a horseshoe shaped journey through the, our front yard and will hold anywhere between 4,000 and 10,000 gallons of water. Actually, we're a little, little bit late meeting with Milton to do this recording because we just got this massive middle of the summer thunderstorm. And I'm looking out, there's water running down the street, but no water's leaving our property. Water is gushing out of our gutters, going into our rain gardens, and we've got all three of our rain gardens got some water in them just in the last uh, hour. So it's so gratifying to have that experience to have these rains come and see that water being held. Then um, here's a few pictures of what they looked like when we first put the rain gardens in. This is from um, the summer of 2008. Uh, we put these in in the fall of 2007. So you can see it's uh, pretty barren. And when we first dig these holes, uh, your neighbor's going to ask you, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> because it's kind of weird. Well, why are you digging these holes in your yard? And, um, and uh, once you plant it out and they see the results, they'll see the difference. But here's what it looked like in 2008. Here's a little later in 2008 when we created our beds and we put our paths in. This was after rain, so you can see there's a little bit of the, the, the grass and the uh, rain gardens have moisture in them, some moisture. And then here it is in 2013, so you can see how the plants grew in. And now you start to get some nice, uh, some substance to the plants themselves. And uh, notice the hazelnut bushes in here. I've circled those for you. And then here they are today in June 2017. I just took these uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you, it's pretty dense. We've got a lot of vegetation in our yard now. And here's those hazelnut bushes now. And uh, we've got our first decent little crop of the hazelnuts coming in this year. So um, it's pretty exciting. Here's a picture uh, of that uh, swale, if you will, or a ditch that connects off the downspot spout that connects rain gardens number one and two. So you can see it's a substantial ditch. And here it is, a picture of it in the spring of 2008, and then another one in 2007. So now people 17. come, yeah, 2017, <laughs> thanks. People can't really see um, these ditches uh, anymore when they walk into our yard. Um, they're pretty much uh, camouflaged because of the fact that we have so much plants and vegetation. This, by the way, to the left is a cherry tree and underneath there are hazelnut, chives, raspberry, lemon balm, wormwood, and other ground covers. Mm. And then here's rain garden number two and rain garden number three. You can see that little connection between the two rain gardens. I put a drain tile in there and covered that up with soil, and so now it's, we don't. Uh, there's a path there. And here it is in 2017. We keep rain garden number two kind of open still, so when we do get a lot of rain, people can actually see the rain. But in rain gardens one and three, there's so much vegetation in the bottom of those two rain gardens, uh, you have to pull plants aside to be able to look down and see the water in the rain garden. And then here's the uh, little spillway that comes off of rain garden number three. We direct the water over to the berm, otherwise it would actually go forward. It would go towards the truck there. So we put a little bit of a ditch over here, and uh, you can hardly tell it's there anymore, but it does move the water to the berm. And here it is in 2017. You can't see the ditch. Everything's kind of lush and green. And here's the same space from the opposite direction. And the, you can see the, um, in 2007, you can see the berm there. That's all the soil from the rain gardens. And we had to do something with it. And so uh, we took a bunch of old brush that we had. We laid it down on the property line, put the soil on top, uh, connected with our neighbors, mm -hmm. asked them um, if they don't mind, we would put it right on the property line. We'll put in the gooseberries and currants and then any berries on their side of the bushes they can pick and maybe on our outsides we'll pick and they said absolutely let's do it so otherwise we're going to pull that whole berm onto our property but uh, with their consent we went ahead and put it on the property line and now we get to share those berries with our neighbors it's inter interesting to see how you still have uh lawn here you still have paths and and places mm -hmm. for for people but n not that much i bet it doesn't take very long to to mm -hmm. manicure your well, space right we keep getting less and less of it, I mean, because the paths are just as pleasant to walk on as, as the lawn. And, and actually maintaining that lawn is, you know, there's, you can't bring in any large mowers anymore. So it's just kind of a little push mower or, a, you know, 
a trimmer to, mm. to deal with the grass. But it looks, you know, looks pleasant. Absolutely. It looks and like I a space to be in. in here um, two days uh, after um, a rain. The water doesn't soak in immediately. We have enough clay in our soil that it'll rest for a little while. Uh, and that's why it's, um, and that's why we need some way for the water. It used to be that the, the land out here had prairie grasses in it, and prairie grasses will get up to five, six, seven feet tall, and their roots go as deep. And so when the rains hit the prairie, the water is pulled down into the ground by all of these roots. But when we removed all the prairie, we just put in crops or lawn, and the roots, the roots on a lawn are only, you know, an inch deep. Um, water doesn't percolate down very quickly. It takes a long time for water to soak in. So that's the purpose of a rain garden, give it a place to sit. Well, our rain gardens, uh, in the earliest days, they would sit there for three days. It would take three days once they filled up for the water to soak in. Now it's about two days because we have enough plants and enough roots that they're pulling the water down. But um, uh, you can see after two days, uh, there's still water, but here's another picture which shows the uh, rain gardens after four days and there's no water and you can see a little bit of cracking in the bottom of the rain garden. So what's really important to understand about rain gardens is they're not wetlands. It's not like you could put cattails in there. They will not survive. Cattails can't survive because the bottom of these rain gardens get bone dry and they're bone dry all summer long because it's just a temporary place to hold water. So the point is, and I wrote this on the slide here, we don't plant water loving species in the rain gardens as there are times when the gardens are very dry too, especially in midsummer. We plant wet water and drought tolerant species to handle wet and dry conditions. Plants that are doing well are daylilies, <laughs> the comfrey, the curly willow, Jerusalem artichoke, and the prairie plants. So I just thought that was important to make that point because that always comes up in our courses, people ask. And now I want to talk a little bit about how we manage water in the side and back of the, our yard. Here's this picture of how the, the water moves off of our property, how it was designed by the original engineers in the most suburban areas. The water is designed, the house is set up a little higher on the property than everywhere where else. Your property lines are a little bit lower and then all the water moves to the property line and then moves off. And here's how water moved on our lot. So what I want to do is look at this part on the upper left hand corner of our property, which is the backyard and the side yard. We have water coming off of our neighbor's house, which actually happens to be my parents. My mom and dad live next door still They're in their 90s. And, um, and that water comes right off of their house right towards our yard and then it runs away. And I saw that as a resource. They said, Bill, if you want to use our water, you can, right? So what we did is um, we've got several beds now in our yard. Uh, Hugo cultures. A uh, Hugo culture is where you dig a hole, put wood in, and put your soil back in. So you have rotting wood in the bottom of these beds, which will hold water, break down slowly, and provide food for your plants as they break down. But we have several of those beds and a couple of berms and another raised bed in the backyard. So here's how we manage the water now in our backyard. The first water that comes off my folks' house and off of our yard goes around this first little Hugo culture. And then I built a little diversion in our yard, just a slight ditch and put the soil to the uphill side. So now water comes and instead of moving off of our property, makes a curve into our yard to our next Hugo culture. That has a ditch in front of it. When that ditch fills up, like a little moat, half moat, then it moves, um, it flows over uh, to the next Hugo culture, which has a moat three quarters of the way around, kind of a horseshoe shaped moat, moat on that one. When that fills, it, it flows over into berm, uh, the first berm. When that berm fills up, it spills over to the next berm. And so you can see how we're taking the same water and we're moving it around the property and holding the water, giving it a place to rest and a place to soak in. So right there, we're probably holding a couple thousand gallons of water. Then the other thing we did is we dug a slight uh, trench and Milton, you and your wife, Rebecca, dug this trench for us yes, to feed us well. And uh, water that comes off of our backyard um, drops into that and it, it's pulled into that berm as well. So now we're capturing that water. And then the water that comes off of our roof, we capture into a 425 gallon water tank. I've got pictures of that here in a minute. And then when that fills up, that water spills over, moves across the yard and goes, goes right past our compost pile, picking up nutrients and puts it in that berm. 
So you can see how we're just constantly capturing water as it moves along. Now, when we get to the point where that berm starts to fill up, if the water backs up, and then at that point, when it backs up about three feet, now that little feeder swale that used to pull water to the berm now acts as a spillway. Water backs up into that feeder swale and very gently goes through the grass, spills off of our property with no erosion, and uh, the system is complete. By the time that whole process has occurred, we're holding probably close to 4,000 gallons of water in our backyard. Now, that, that only happens maybe once or twice a year if we have a rain event that is, you know, that really fast and furious and those will fill up. But uh, there's a way for the water to go, to move. That's important. Yeah. So what we wanted to do now is basically just give, show you a, a, an overview design of our entire yard. When we design, we usually design in layers. We design in priorities. Uh, because of certain factors, we always design for water first. Okay. Then we design access, we design in our paths. After that, we'll design in our key planting areas. And then after that, we design in the specific cultivars or specific plants. So, um, so this, this, is the, this, is our, this is our permaculture design for our yard. This first one shows where water is collected in our yard. So each one of these blue areas is a, some kind of a um, rain garden or a swale or, or a, um, what would you call it? A moat. I like calling it moats. And uh, then the brown represents the path system. So these are how we get around the yard. And it's really important to define your paths. It's what we discovered um, when we first started. We had grass and we were kind of stymied. Like where do we begin? Where do we start planting? And uh, we called a good friend of ours. And what did he say? Oh, he said, put your paths in first. And as soon, if you can look at this picture, you'll notice that as soon as you put a path in, then you have a defined area. Uh, that shows where a bed can go. And uh, that was real helpful to us because we knew we wanted to put in lots of different beds, but we had to put them in one at a time and we needed, you know, some kind of guidance as to where to start. Right. Um, so we started, you know, first with just maybe one and two and, uh, and then we, you know, added over the years and we've had a lot more plantings and it's become more of a food forest now uh, where before it was more just, um, more yeah. shrub shrub layers and, uh, and berries and annuals. Yeah, yeah, we were growing quite a few annuals in our front yard. I wanted to say one more thing just about water is, I mean, one reason why we're um, making such a big deal about water is that uh, it's really important kind of for the overall resilience of the entire property. So we're not dependent upon treated water from uh, our city system. Mm -hmm. Uh, which has chlorine in it, and that's not something we'd uh, really want to put on our plants. Um, we're also just in general concerned uh, for the planet and that we anything that we're not using directly in our yard right away, um, that's soaking slowly into the ground uh, rather than rushing down to the streams that are nearby. Um, so, you know, let, there's less erosion and it's slowly percolating and keeping the aquifers hopefully below. If, if everyone in our neighborhood did this, you know, it would be, we would really be making an impact, um, you know, on the, on the whole system. And we do, once we started putting these in, um, you know, it did have an effect in our neighborhood and people wanted to have water tanks or rain gardens or ways to move about their yard. And so we see slowly over time that um, a lot more uh, of our friends and neighbors are adopting these practices. Oh, that's fun. We, you know, we could, we could probably estimate that um, we're saving somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100,000 gallons of water is staying on our yard now. And um, the prairie used to do that, but it can't, the prairie is not here anymore. And so we're doing it this way rather than because the prairie can't do it. This is our way of solving that. If every uh, suburban community um, basically uh, uh, encouraged this, uh, we could change the, you could return the hydrological cycle to where it needs to be. Well, well, such well, as the, in Kansas City, where they're doing the ten thousand, you gardens. know, rain gardens. Yeah. And the thing about this space is, it's it's now it's not just a prairie uh, with no people in it. You've created a space for people that that still functions w within the larger ecosystem. Uh, yeah. So you're not diminishing that function at all by you you being there. Right now, you're a part of the whole, rather than carving out your little niche and kind of. Pushing, you say pushing that we're that also uh, 
created a home for wildlife in our yard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, for, you know, if you could think back, you know, 15 years ago where we'd rarely see even a bird in our yard, you know, now we have, you know, many, many different species of birds and animals and even our, our, our little pond where the aquaponics is has become the local watering hole for <laughs> all the neighborhood cats and, um, you know, and other wildlife too. But um, it's it becomes very interesting. They have their own pattern that they fall follow for how they use it. Yeah, it's 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 really a lovely place just to be. Well, let's show you some of these pictures. Let's finish the design. So then here are the beds. These are the beds that over time Becky and I decided where we wanted to plant things. And then the next slide shows the actual main plants, the overstory. Um, uh, excuse me. It'll show the overstory plants. And then on the left-hand side are all the plants that we, uh, not all the plants, but many of the plants that we have in the understory throughout the, uh, the yard. I think it's really interesting how with the design, so you're, you're, you know, you, you create the environment. Uh, you didn't say, I want an apple and a peach. And well, you have lots of peaches and uh, hazels and elderberries. You know, you said, well, let's deal with the water first. Okay, now look at the space. Now where are the gardens, where are the paths? And it emerged from what was there rather than uh, you making kind of somewhat arbitrary choices about what uh, it was supposed to look like, right? You, right. you let it, you let it kind of in some ways decide for itself. Yeah, we were in relationship with our yard and um, there were things that did really well. We said, well, we really like those. Um, actually we had that uh, one peach tree or two, we had plant, planted two peach trees. And we started getting some amazing yields, amazing crops off of those. I've got pictures of the early peach trees. And we loved it so much, we put in more peach trees. So <laughs> there's a dominance of peach trees in our yard. But um, they last about maybe 10 or 12 years, yeah. and they tend to, uh, tend to die out. And so we've got more coming behind it. So we'll always have some healthy peach trees. <laughs> So Milton, those two peach trees in the backyard, the small ones, are ones that actually you um, were there, I think, during one of those years. And they had died back in the winter through damage from rabbits. Okay. And we thought they were, we thought they were dead. And it turns out that they both survived, but they survived from the rootstock. And okay. we had no idea what kind of peaches we might get, but we just decided to leave if them. If they were peaches. Or, could have been yeah. apricot, you know. We decided to right. leave them in, and they both yield very, very well. So... It's kind of cool. You tried grafting on that once. <laughs> yes, I attempted to. Yeah, the yeah. graft the graft didn't take, but the rootstock came back, and <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> beautiful. That's amazing, yeah. Beautiful young uh, peach trees there in those two gardens. Well, and they're probably healthier for that being being the original right. grafting right. stock, right? Yeah. Well, then the uh, last layer of the design is where you put a place in the overstory. So these are the existing trees and shrubs that are already on the property. And one or two of them, maybe uh, several of them we put in since we've been there, but most of them were put in before we even arrived. So uh, they're just maturing and getting bigger and bigger. So that's the basic design. That's uh, what the Midwest permaculture looks like uh, from a map. Now let's take a look at it, see what it looks like in pictures. So uh, here's a picture of our house. Uh, this first one is probably 15, uh, or maybe, no, not 15, 10 years ago. When we first started experimenting, I think the rain gardens are in. But you can see this is our neighbor's yard. This is mom and dad's yard. And this is what our yard looked like. But you can definitely see where our yard begins. It was all grass. And then mm -hmm. you can see where all the vegetation begins is right. where, where our yard is. And here's a picture of it today. Uh, it's very, you can probably see the house now. There's quite a bit of vegetation in there. And I'm going to come around and take a picture from the front so you can see what the front looks like. So with just a little bit of hardscape, um, a little um, pergola, or a little arch in the back, and a little fence in the front, and flowers, uh, there's a lot going on, but it looks um, it looks inviting, and that's what uh, a lot of people have told us. It's, it's obvious from from your this picture here, the cues to care, um, the cues of care. You know, you've got the little picket fence in the front, and the pergola in, in the back, and it it looks like a space that someone's tending and this is intentional rather than some some weedy yard you know they, they never pay any attention to it it looks very intentional and, and uh, i think that that enhances uh the perceived beauty right yeah. well we do have some more picket fences to go along the, the yeah. edge <laughs> they're just not they're yeah. just not there yet yeah. it, it, 
we have to buy some time somewhere. <laughs> right. yeah, just, I think that's something that we should just mention right off the bat, and that is uh, we're all, both really busy just you know managing our business and we're involved in our community, and uh, we actually have a hard time finding enough time to play in our yard. So it's uh, not we haven't done everything we, we would like to do. So It also balances uh, the amount of time that you actually have and and the the kind of the result of the yard you can't spend time that you don't have on sure. that on your yard right so it, it it you might you might plan bigger than than what actually you end up with but but whatever you have is, is what you end up with but wherever wherever it lays so well i wanted to say too for people who might be considering doing permaculture projects in their their suburban kind of lot um, just take heart it takes time and over time, uh, if you can be patient with it, uh, it does pay off in the long run because the systems start to really um, take care of themselves. Uh, so there's a lot going on in our yard that we don't have to spend any time with right now. And we can just go harvest a lot of things like berries and fruits and things like that. Uh, there's also a lot of herbs that just are come up from year to year and we just, you know, Mm -hmm. can start taking advantage of those. And so there's smaller areas where we're doing annual kind of production, but uh, there's other areas that just are faithfully serving, um, you know, the entire system. So. Yeah, and there's also a rhythm that goes with it. I mean, I guess if we went in and did everything at one time, um, we would miss some of the serendipity that occurs. There are things that happen because you didn't get time to it, uh, like trimming those peach trees down. <laughs> But, you know, they, they get big right. enough, you'd say, well, let's see, look at them. They look healthy. Let's see what's going to happen to them. So if you're always on top of it, sometimes you don't allow the serendipity to occur. So that, 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 that idea of let's see what happens, right, is yeah. let's see how this, what, what it wants to be, and then we'll make decisions about it rather than making the decisions and not seeing what its own potential is. Right. Observation. Observation is a big theme in permaculture. So anyway, this is the and great, interaction. Yeah, observe and interact. <laughs> um, I wanted to just point out this particular rain garden is that you notice it's not um, it's flat on the bottom. So we go down about twelve inches and then we f we smooth out the sides have about a forty five degree slope. So the clover came right out of the grass uh, and went down the banks of those uh, rain gardens right away. So um, we had a little bit of seeding in the bottom, but. The point is, is that um, it's not just this continual, this bowl, it's a flat spot. And so now uh, you actually step down into them. And um, here's what they looked like the following later that summer, first summer. So that those got dug in the fall. This is the uh, middle to the late next year. And then here it is two or three years later, same profile. And then here it is today. Yeah, again, again, that process of you made this this uh, high impact change on your yard on your the system, and then see well what does this do what uh, how do I how do I work with this exactly and what what does this change that I've done actually do to my yard and then how do I work with that Yes, right. Yeah. Um, this is a picture I took from the roof in I think two thousand and eight. This was before we had our paths in. And it was after a rain, so you can see the rain gardens actually are holding water. And um, here's what it looks like today. So you can see uh, it's filled in really nicely. Try and get the same perspective on here so that you can see where the sidewalks and the streets are. And then um, here's uh, looking squarely onto our front yard. There's rain garden number one, two, and three. And notice the sidewalk on the left and the tree trunk to the right. And here's the exact same place. Um, uh, 10 years later, rain garden one, two, and three, and the sidewalk and the tree, and the path and the little pergola. And here's the uh, back corner of our of our backyard, and you can see there's a small ash tree, there's a steel post, and the gutter in the foreground, standing from the roof, and here's what it looks like today. We have a little tool shed. Milton, you hadn't seen that before. That's no, that was new. Yeah, that's, that was a Christmas present from Becky for me. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So here comes this truck with a delivery of, well, well, great. What's this? You know, and uh, <laughs> June, through July, we had it up. So, yeah, and you also see on the bottom right hand corner, you can see our water tank as well. So that water tank is really a blessing. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. 
Here's a couple of stories. Uh, do you want to talk about this? Because this was actually uh, your idea. Oh, this is um, this is a, I think it's a fir tree that we had in, in the yard. We had three of them. And we were, it was dying back and we were going to take it out. So we, um, Bill went out and started trimming it. And by the time he got to the top of it, uh, I came out and it was still lush and green on top. And uh, I said, well, wait, stop. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't cut it anymore. I said, it looks like a Dr. Seuss tree. And so we decided just to use that as a post. We could leave it in another year and use it as a post. So we tied string on it and we grew uh, green beans. And there's the green beans growing up, the uh, the lattice. And mm -hmm. I, I like to tell the story that we must have been away the weekend that they got up to the top of the uh, of the lattice because there was no one there to tell them to stop. You're at the top. Stop. Time, time to stop growing. They kept growing. They grew all the way through the top of the tree and uh, are hanging down. Yeah. <laughs> we ended up getting out an eight-foot step ladder to get up there and harvest those beans, and they were absolutely delicious. And that same year, um, I noticed um, later in the year that uh, you can see this one, there's a, some squash leaves coming out of the back of this tree. We don't get around to the backside of this little uh, evergreen. And um, so I go over there to, to kind of pull the vine out because the, the, the plant itself was out in the yard in the other direction. But one vine went behind itself and went up into this tree and just came out the backside. Well, actually, that was just, it grew, uh, it was a compost pile that just grew out of, voluntarily, out of a compost pile. Right. And so squash from the previous year, but go ahead. Yeah, it grew through the tree. When I went around the back to pull the vine out, I opened up the vines, and here's this, you know, eight, nine-inch butternut squash staring me right in the face. And then it's, that's when I really realized that, you know, squash and beans, these are climbing plants. These are vining plants. They did not evolve in the desert or out in the prairie, out in the open. They evolve probably on the edge where the forest is, or even in the forest, whereas they needed a, to get the sunlight, they figured out a way to adapt as they climb around, and they put out leaves wherever they can. So during the course of the day, as the sun is moving through the sky, maybe only 20% of the leaves are in, day, are in sunlight, but that's all that that plant needs in order to produce a crop. So... Um, now, you know, you think about how many people actually have butternut squash trees in their yard. They just never knew it. They just haven't planted the butternut squash next to their evergreen or whatever other decorative trees that you have. You know, that Bradford pear that's there to uh, look pretty in the spring. Why not have some, use it as a, uh, as a lattice to grow other kinds of crops on? This was a volunteer even. This, yeah. this grew, you, did, you didn't even plant it. You just let it grow and said, let's see what's going to happen. Right. And it uh, looks like you got some butternut squash off of it. It was delicious. So here's a picture of the water tank. Um, we started with a 55-gallon drum, but um, in the first rain, we ran outside. We were all excited, and it filled up in about a minute and a half. I mean, it just, you know, when you get a downpour, it doesn't take long to get 55 gallons. So we bought this 425-gallon tank for 250 bucks. It fits into the back of a pickup truck. So it's a very standard thing you get at farm stores. And, um, and then we put it up on a stand so that we would have some um, uh, head pressure. Mm -hmm. And here's what it looks like today. So it's still there. Put some boards around the front. Fills in a one-inch rain. So um, I think we had about a half of a tank uh, this afternoon. And so with that hard rain we had, it already had filled up and it was already spilling over. But it's not gone. You're still harvesting it within your system, right? That's right. So, I mean, we don't even think about it. And every time it rains, the tank gets topped off. How much rain comes off of your roof? That's a good question. If you have a thousand square foot home, which is kind of a modest home, that's 623 gallons comes off of a thousand square feet. So our house is just under 2000 square feet. So we get about 1200 gallons of water that comes off of our roof. 800 gallons goes forward towards the front yard and get into our rain gardens. 400 gallons comes back into that tank. So in a one inch rain, we'll get 400 gallons out of the 425. So in permaculture, we like to talk about zones. And so you, it's the zones of use and zones of access. Uh, but one of the things that makes practical sense is, is right off your kitchen, if you can make a kitchen herb garden, 
for the things that you might be um, wanting to use every day. So these are like your, um, your green onions and your herbs and your lettuces and tomatoes and things like that. So this is right off of our back uh, deck. And uh, this, this garden was created for me one uh, Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I ask for no stuff, but if, they, if my sons will give me labor, that's always a good thing. So they, they dug this bed out and uh, we created it just within a, uh, within a day and I planted in it, in it right away. And Bill, um, we measured a, a moat I guess you used uh, a so, site level, yeah. a site level, so that it was uh, even. But this way, the water comes off, you know, the side of the roof there, and it will fill in and around this, and just keep the ground saturated. It's not moving anywhere else, but it is just a basically functions like a moat around this little garden. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can see on the left hand side there, this there's a lot of variety in this garden. Um, and it was quite a lot of production, and it was just really simple for us to do, and it was very accessible for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you notice that the last two plants on there, Becky added volunteer amaranth and volunteer lamb's quarter because we eat those. We didn't plant those, but when you till the soil in the in the in the Illinois, inevitably you're going to get amaranth or it's called pigweed and uh, lamb's quarter, and um, they're really tasty when they're young and put them in salads. So. Um, uh, we got a nice, we got a nice free crop right. of those. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, also you can see the berm in the back and the water backing up uh, yeah. at that berm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the system is full, and that berm is as full as it gets, and that water has backed up into the feeder swale that you and Rebecca dug, and it's trickling through the grass over there. But uh, I love it when the smoke fills up; it just feels really good. And then there's just water sitting there for about a day, day and a half, and just continues to keep that bed moist. Now, I do want to say something, you know, this bed would, is probably, I mean, this, this view of our yard with a lot of grass is still there um, at, at this time. So this is, looks pretty suburban. It doesn't, you know, this is something that a lot of people would feel very comfortable with mm -hmm. uh, as far as a simple permaculture design in their yard. It still doesn't look, you know, oddly different from the neighbors, but the way ours looks today, there's a lot more vegetation and a lot less grass and, uh, we might be um, living with something that is more or over vegetated than some people would feel comfortable with, but you just need to design for what your needs and your wants are. And um, so there's a lot, there's a big variety of uh, solutions that any suburban home can create for uh, implementing permaculture yeah. on their property. Yeah, permaculture design can be as simple or as complex as we want it to be. It Correct. doesn't have to be one particular way. Here's one of my favorite pictures. This is Becky with the peach tree. So this is what really got us excited about peaches and, you know, to plant this tree and to really not do anything. And then, you know, every other year or so, we get a bumper crop like this off of these peach trees. So they continue to come in and every year we'll harvest the peaches, um, chop them up. We'll do a variety of things with them, but besides eating as many as we can, can you imagine eating so many peaches? You actually go, you know, I don't really want any more peaches. <laughs> That's such a good feeling, especially when the first ones come in, you can hardly wait to consume them. They just, they're so precious. But we'll take the surplus and we'll cut it up and freeze them on trays and then scrape them up and put them into bags as little frozen nuggets. And now they're good for all winter long in smoothies mm -hmm. or in uh, pies or whatever we want to. But I, I want to say something too, just in terms of local food and kind of following the seasons of nature, um, it's real important to, you know, overindulge in something like peaches when the crop comes in, you know, and then be full and satisfied with it and then maybe enjoy some later in the winter. But I think as, as consumers, we've grown accustomed to being able to have um, most fruits and vegetables all year long from all over the world. And in talking, you know, in the context of this um, local food summit, you know, we, we really need to look at how we can uh, honor the seasons and honor the seasonability of, of a lot of the plants and fruits and mm -hmm. foods that we grow and eat them at that time and enjoy them and relish them and, you know. Yeah, eat be, with the seasons, yeah. <laughs> be ready, be ready for the next year when it comes around. And then uh, I think the last picture we have here is this one of our aquaponic system. We um, built our first aquaponic system, I guess it was 2008, maybe 2009. It was made out of 55 gallon drums. 
And we just got the hang of aquaponics is, is where you're raising fish in the water. And then to keep that water clean, you pump it up and run it through a series of beds. And those beds, you grow vegetation. And in our case, we're growing a lot of things that we can eat. In this case, you can see it looks like um, Swiss chard and a little bit of uh, kale and some other things, some lettuce. But um, having this system, um, by the way, these are some of the first fish we had. So they were little guppies when we got them. And now they're, you know, uh, and they're not to eat. Uh, a, a real aquaponics system is designed so that you can eat the fish and eat the plants. In our case, we were more interested in getting the nutrients from the fish and creating a lovely environment. So we have a system, we can actually move the fish in the wintertime because we grow the same, we do the same thing in the house in a smaller system uh, and have greens all winter long. But this is such a lovely little system. It's so easy to care for now that we know what we're doing. And um, it's such a nice feature in our yard. Anytime anybody comes over to visit, we end up sitting down next to the aquaponic system and just enjoy. And this, of course, is where all the birds come and the cats <laughs> and uh, squirrels and uh, everything else in our yard ends up enjoying this uh, little uh, water feature. The other thing we end up in our yard with are toads and frogs, and we've never had those before, and they're voracious eaters of bugs. So they go around and they eat some of the uh, uh, bugs or insects that are uh, eating some of our other plants. So it's a lovely feature to have, and it's not much work. So I think that's about it for us. We just wanted to give you an idea of what our house looked like and kind of what it's been like for us doing permaculture for 10 years. Um, it's really our life. It's kind of what we do. Um, besides the teaching, we do design work. Uh, we've got a presentation for you coming up in the next day or two uh, with Jordan Rubin. So that's a large project that we're doing down in Missouri. Uh, that's in Jordan Rubin's Heal the Planet Farm. And we put in miles of swales. We're doing key lining down there, working with cover crops with their livestock. We've done greenhouses and a variety of things. And we have another project over in Ohio that we've been working on with a friend of ours now. And uh, we put in ponds and um, built a really wonderful barn made out of containers. So um, the work is growing. Uh, and it's um, incredibly satisfying to be able to work on our projects and on other projects and see them slowly evolve. And you can kind of see the, the land healing. You can see people be becoming, enjoying being in relationship with their land and how it's beginning to affect um, the neighbors. So I, I see us doing this for a while. We're not, we're still pretty young. <laughs> so I'm thinking we're gonna do this for another 10 or 15, 20 years, so. You have created a really pleasing place for you to live. Um, and it's, it's not something that, that you even had an end goal in mind, necessarily. You, you, might, you had kind of a general, you had the, the ethics, right, in mind, care, care of the earth, care of people, care of the future. But um, you, 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 you started interacting with this space. You um, started intervening in some of the, the energy flows, like where the water goes, um, creating spaces for things to happen, for things to grow. Um, letting things be in that space as well and, and saying, well, what's, what's this uh, peach stump going to do? You know, hey, oh, look at, look at this uh, squash growing out of the tree. I'm just going to watch it and see where, where it goes. And it's a source of joy, you know, that, that I, I even hear now as you recount it, you know, that, that, that the, the fact that you let those things be is, is a joyous place for you to go back to even now. So, mm -hmm. so you've, you kind of, you kind of created a place of a wonder and a, and a place that you can journey in as it changes, right? You're journeying in the, the one spot as it matures and evolves. And it's really, really uh, nice to see. Mm, thanks. I wanted to say um, just one, one more detail. If you notice from the early shots are uh, the siding on our house was yellow and then it, at some point it changed to green, mm -hmm. but um you know, that also, just that change in itself, is we recited the house, but uh, in the process of doing the reciting, we had to remove a lot of vegetation just in order to get to do the actual construction of that. So that was just another factor that, uh, that gave us a chance to reconsider how we were doing um, a, lot of the, a lot of the plant systems. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, permaculture is not just about the plants. It's about all forms of energy, as you mentioned, and working with energy flows. And one of the energy flows we had was a house that was it was comfortable in the winter, but it was a little drafty. So when we recited the house, 
we decided to go ahead and get uh, new windows. We got deeper windows and we added two inches of closed cell foam to the outside of our house and then the siding on top of that. So um, we basically, we almost cut our heating and cooling bill in half just by, when we resided, adding some insulation to it. Adding additional. Additional yeah. insulation. Yeah, doubling so it up. This is, these are important ways to save on energy. And uh, we've got a siding instead of lasting 25 years, should last 50 to 100 years. So now there's less work involved as well. So yeah, it looks nice. Journey. So thank you place. for uh, thank you for joining us, Milton. Thanks yeah, for helping us uh, through this first session. And uh, we have five more coming. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy all five of them and enjoy the rest of the summit. This is a wonderful lineup of speakers. So we're glad you're joining us, and uh, we'll look for you a little bit later. Take care. Thank you.